This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Next on Big Story, a history of mistreatment and abuse. They didn't come and tell about three months after they were buried and told them that they had passed away. But it's all coming out now, you know. Secrets can't be buried forever. Forced to give up their land. The genes we're carrying from our ancestors is there. And we're all uh, doing our best to make it through each day and to connect our identity back again. Reckoning with a dark past that is still being revealed. It's hard to even put a precise number on the direct physical losses, never mind the intergenerational trauma, um, the cultural loss. A language on the verge of vanishing. When I was growing up, everybody spoke Lakota in our community. But today, the language is dying off because we're losing a lot of our Lakota elders. And the looming threats of the present time. Our reservation is, consists of two counties, Zeebok County and Dewey County. And the last census, Zeebok County was the poorest county in the United States, and that means half of our reservation. What future is there for the most vulnerable minority in America? They're praying for our young people that are struggling. They're praying for those that are contemplating suicide. They're praying for all the alcohol and drug addictions. The race gap in the U.S. Native Americans, next on Big Story. of Native American children taken forcibly from their communities and put into boarding schools that stripped them of their culture has never been fully investigated. Interior Secretary Deb Holland announced the investigation last week. It will document the history of the boarding schools established by the U.S. government to force assimilation of indigenous children. For those of you that are new to the conversation, the federal government had a policy of forced assimilation for about 150 years. What is now Susan on the west side used to be the Rapid City Indian Boarding School. Thus far, the volunteers have found approximately 50 students who passed there and were not kept track of. The only reason we found those 50 children is that this team painfully went through page by page of 100-year-old ledger documents and uh, the school would simply cross someone's name off and write dead. So we don't have a lot of information about where they were buried. As we've started to reveal the names of these 50 children, we've had a number of families come forward and say they never knew what happened. They were never informed. The children were simply taken and never came back. Across North America, the remains of thousands of missing indigenous children have been found near the old grounds of boarding schools, like this one in Rapid City. So today we are acknowledging the, the painful and often ignored history of boarding schools and residential schools. It's often excluded from history books, from curriculums, like people just don't learn about it. You don't hear about residential schools and boarding schools when you learn about U.S. history. And as a Native American person or an indigenous person, it's part of our, it's been part of our lives. 
The shoes signify or represent the kids. Um, kids as early as young as three years old went into boarding schools um, all the way through 18 years old. It's just really a visual representation. It's something for people to look at and to connect with the kids that you see now. It's just a way of, of visualizing that loss. The intention of boarding schools was to kill the Indian and save the man. It was deliberately meant to strip people of culture, of language, and it was meant for, to assimilate people into American culture. It was meant to detach people from their cultural identities, from their tribal communities, from their homelands. And that's why we are working so hard now to start unpacking those layers of what it's done, the effects it's had, and how we still feel those effects today. You see when you're growing up there, you know, so much cruelty and the nuns were like authoritarians. I had a cousin, they caught her and they just whipped her and whipped her till she, it, I, You can even count the number of times she was hit. You, you see a lot of things, you know. I see now a priest, all the kids would be sent up there and he would grab certain ones and put them on his lap and you would see him. He would be touching him, you know? And uh, I always thought about that. I always thought about those little girls. And I don't know, I guess there was something in my brain that, that uh, uh, to protect, you know? Because I never went for one around him. Roberta Kofi survived her boarding school. Some of her family members were not as lucky could be diseases, we don't know. Could have been beat to death, don't know, you know. Could have just been outright uh, murder. Don't know that either, you know. All we know is that uh, it did happen, you know. And now it's coming to light and I knew nothing about my culture, nothing. Because it's just like you, uh, they took your mind. They didn't only just take your mind, but they took your soul too. And we weren't able to practice our religion. We weren't able to practice this way of life. Roberta's great aunt died when they were teenagers at the school. They didn't come and tell about three months after they were buried and told them that they had, they had passed away. So. You know, things like that, that happen that uh, you, you would lose your kids and they would bury them, you wouldn't even know, know about it. It's a process and it's a long walk, you know. I'm still not okay with it. I, I still get mad over my mom and the things done to our native people. It just, just breaks your heart, you know. But it's all coming out now, you know. Secrets can be buried forever. These discoveries prompted a summer of reckoning in 2021. The Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, the first Native American to hold a cabinet position in the country's history, announced a formal review of the boarding school system. I think that we maybe don't want to look at this dark chapter of American history um, because it is so egregious. I mean, when we talk about the systemic, physical, psychological, sexual abuse of children, it's horrific, right? It's disgusting, it's repulsive. And to think that um, that program was instituted for so long and so recently, um, I, I think is a very challenging fact to confront. Um, nevertheless, it's absolutely essential that we do so, so that we can better understand our indigenous neighbors um, and you know, so that the federal government can rectify um, some of the tremendous losses. A memorial was set up at the steps of the old school where the children died. I'd like to sing a song here uh, for the children that passed and uh, for our future generations. We have them all around us here today and uh, bringing more positive awareness to uh, what we need to do to preserve uh, our cultural and Lakota way of life. That's the song. It says, uh, with this pipe, I, I stand and I pray unto the great spirit. <clears throat> That's a short translation of what it says. <clears throat> I 
Nobody in this world can take this from us, who we are. These, these places here behind us, these hills, the genes we're carrying from our ancestors is there. This is a part of historical, I hate to say trauma, but I guess that's what it is. And we are all uh, doing our best to make it through each day and to connect our identity back again, reconnect. This is who we are, this is our land. Let's do something for our children to make it a better place for them. I think it's just a matter of time before we have a real reckoning with the legacy of boarding schools. It's hard to even put a precise number on um, the, the direct physical losses, never mind the intergenerational trauma, um, the cultural loss, um, the divorce from identity and from Native political participation. And it's tribes that are taking the initiative to do that work, to repatriate their ancestors, to make sure that those children um, you know, come home, that they receive a proper burial, um, that their families are notified and informed. The COVID pandemic highlighted an already grim economic outlook, especially for the young people on the reservation. Someone goes to school for filmmaking, they come back here and there's, there's nowhere to get a job. So that's a lack of opportunity right there, you know. Someone has a passion for something and they go away and study it and then they come back to the res because they love where, their home and then there's nowhere to get employment for all the work they just did in school. There's not much to do apart from playing sports in schools. and You know, you can't really go anywhere and hang out and get involved in activities. The older people, they had their chance. It's the youth. It's their turn. And you give them the opportunity, you give them the right tools, and then let them go. Kyle Mestad is frustrated by how life on the reservation is portrayed in the media. It's, it's called poverty porn. It basically, it's like, oh, let's go down to the res and film the worst house, or let's get the most grimy things. And I think it's great to come down here and tell some good stories. You know, show some great stories because there's a lot of great things happening here. Native Americans have the highest suicide rates in the nation and young Native Americans face an even greater risk. There were 151 deaths by suicide, but that's only part of the story. Eileen Janis is a community activist who works with the youth in the Pine Ridge Reservation. Oh, okay. When they're connected to our Native American culture and our traditions, they're more calm. And so those youth that have a connection are just outstanding to me. They, they are really good examples to other youth that doesn't have that chance. I want them to take every opportunity there is. I want them to be problem solvers for themselves and to feel good about themselves. And if I had a magic wand, I would make sure every one of them had nice shoes. Every one of them had clothes. I would make sure they had food to eat and the basics of knowing how to pray and understanding there is a higher power. Here at the restaurant, the reservation's youth receive training for the basic skill set required to enter the job market. It's kind of like a second home. I really enjoy my coworkers. I've learned people skills, how to talk. I've learned how to cook, time management, cleaning. I think without this place, the youth wouldn't really have anywhere to really get jobs at because most of the jobs are taken up by older people. So it's hard for younger people around here to find jobs. 
Even before the pandemic, unemployment was rife, with rates ranging from 20% to 80% unemployment in some reservations. So that's why with Out of Bounds and the jobs we're trying to help, it may only be a few right now, but they're gonna be the examples to the others to say, well, they taught me how to work. This is the OST's Got Talent, season two, episode three. Welcome to the show. If you are a talented individual, hit us up right now. They're shooting a documentary and you could be a part of that. Kyle runs a talent contest to encourage people on the reservation to get more involved and spotlight local talent and encourage them to make their voices heard. And what it was originally was during the lockdown, if people were bored, we wanted to give them something to do. You know, just if they had a talent, they'd come on Zoom, show their talent. The country singer and the magician were pretty good, and then there was a Lakota singer, she was pretty good too. I better not be an eight of spades. Ah, look at this guy, what the? Come on now. Hello. Many on the reservation <laughs> complained that the Native American experience is ignored in popular culture. So they're producing their own material in order to see themselves on screen. That's my main goal is I want to be able to open up doors for them. It's not hard, it really isn't. It's not hard to create opportunities. You have to reach deep down inside yourself and think, what do I like? Throughout American culture, really, we see this perpetuation of a stereotype of Native people. And we have it everywhere from products that you could buy in a grocery store or um, at your shopping mall, all the way to film and television. And when we have those stereotypes, right, they become the only thing that we know about Native people or that we think that we know about Native people. Um, and so when we couple the, you know, diminishing of Native voices or a of our truths, right, and who we are, our culture, our ways. And then we have this replacement idea, a very monolithic, flat version um, of a stereotype of Native people. It's very easy to see how then, as a society, we associate that with being Native people. On the 29th of December, 1890, more than 150 Native Americans from the Lakota tribe were killed by US soldiers. For me to talk about what took place here is the imagination of who we could put ourselves in that imagination. You come here and the weather was warm when it came, but you came in wagons, you came on horses, and you came here to seek refuge. The soldiers started to disarm the Lakota. A gun went off, and the soldiers opened fire. People started to die, and military started to shoot, and they started to justify what they did by saying that the people were armed. But yet, historians and history, and many that were here through their descendants, tell the story that they were um, disarmed. We can say that there was chasing and, and there were people escaping. You can imagine a lot of them fleeing into the, the ravines and, and running to the mountain or seeking a way to get out of here. I try to place myself. How would a young child and a, and a, and a woman running, knowing in their heart is beating and, they're, and somebody's, uh, they know what the, a gun can do and they're running and they're trying to desperately get away out of the range of the, the weapons. And, and then you have men who are fully armed, who have swords and, and rifles and, and running and shooting at them and chasing them down without even thinking and hesitating, decapitate them or just shoot them uh, in, in the most uh, heinous way. By the end, as many as 300 Lakota men, women, and children were killed by the soldiers. The American government is a, to us, is considered a, a, an occupational force. 
true Americans need to understand they came here and conquered and killed and took. Once they understand that, then they can start to start the beginning to understand the healing process that it will take. That what they have done can't be forgiven unless they start to forgive themselves and understand that we are human beings just as they are. America, you need to be held accountable. You need to be shown that what you have done is not right. You have an, an apology is not the way to go. You need to start really taking a look at what has to be done here. What we really want as Native people is for people to understand, right, that we're here today, um, learn about and respect our histories, and also work with us, right, as tribal governments and, you know, our non-Native neighbors. You know, we're all American citizens, but we're here today, right? We're not on the sideline. You know, we're not just off somewhere, out of sight, out of mind. You know, we're very much here today and we are your neighbors, we are your partners. And again, that relationship is benefited, right, from understanding about who we are as tribal communities. Because COVID-19 has killed elders who were responsible for maintaining those cultures and traditions. In the middle of the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, the Takini School has become central in the reservation fight against COVID-19, keeping the reservation alive. Normally it's a, a loud hallway filled with voices and laughter. It's a very uh, surreal feeling seeing it empty and hearing it quiet. The nearly 200 students receive food from the school, a crucial step as the reservation at times imposed some of the strictest lockdowns in the U.S. to slow COVID spread. Our kitchen prepares a cold lunch and a warm meal for our students for every other day uh, food delivery. And our transportation department uh, delivers it out to our communities. We do this because we realize uh, how much our families depend on school systems, not only you know, provide academics to our students, but then also you know, our students uh, do need a breakfast and a lunch. The school serves 175 children and their families, spread out over many miles around the school. During this pandemic, we want to keep our children fed and you know, so that they're being healthy as much as we can. You know, some of them need it real bad, so it's, it, it helps them out. It makes me feel good because we get to see our kids again, you know. I think some of them are struggling. It's pretty hard, you know, um, especially when you're isolated out here. But they're, they're getting through it, you know. As, as our school's name is, you know, it's called Takini, and it's, we're called survivors. So. When the school was closed to students due to COVID, it highlighted how much the school had been lacking all along. When the pandemic hit and we closed, we had five laptops for students. Three of them worked. COVID-19 has really been a blessing for Takini School with our funding and our allocation, providing 21st century learning devices. We're now a one-to-one -one school. If COVID went to hit, we wouldn't be a one-to-one -one school. We wouldn't have um, the technology that we need for virtual instruction. The sage, kind of like a cleansing and healing for, you know, whether it's spirits or sickness, you know, you can, this is what we'd use here to protect you from anything here and anything out there. Uh, my name is Jordan Charles Knife. My Lakota name is Zuya'i. You can tell in the kids that they're not really at their full potential. Morale, whatever you want to say, is a little low, you know? It's been all right. I've been doing good grades, good grades and stuff, being in class. I've been wanting to go back since the, the start of the school. We lost a lot of relatives due to the, the pandemic, you know. For me, it was a lot of knowledge gone really quick, you know. What they taught us, we have to pass down, and it was, uh, it was, it was really tough to see a lot of the grandparents go, you know. 
We make our decisions together as people. And essential to that democracy is that we all be well enough educated to make good decisions. And we are making decisions that affect everybody. And our educational system is central to that. We built our country on an economic basis that included the labor of people who were enslaved. And we fought a war over that. And we ended slavery. And then we struggled after that to achieve our goals of equality. We are still struggling to achieve our goals of equality. And in order to continue to do that, we have to understand our problems and where they came from. We've done it some with the African American community. We've done it, I think, to a lesser extent with Native Americans. And also to a lesser extent with respect to Hispanic Americans. Our history is complicated. Our community is complicated. We, don't, we barely understand it ourselves, and the country doesn't understand it at all. Nine Native American children who died at a boarding school hundreds of miles away have finally been returned to South Dakota. They were from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe and attended the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania more than 100 years ago. All the former students of Carlisle are deceased, but there are plenty of people alive who went through this type of assimilation education. I think listening is incredibly important to the people that have lived through it. And just, you know, sometimes you just have to listen, and that's the most important bit. The Carlisle Indian Industrial School was the first of its kind. Where you would be removed from every influence you had ever grown up with, and then surrounding you with children from other Native American communities, and in some cases, Alaska and Florida, literally the, the geographical opposites of the country. You know, there wouldn't be much in common uh, except the fact that you were in the same situation at Carlisle. The school's educational system was influenced by the military experiences of its founder. Richard Henry Pratt is commanding a group of cavalry soldiers that become known as the Buffalo Soldiers. And they were unique in the fact that they were African Americans. And their job is to chase down some of the peoples that wouldn't bow down to government authority. So Pratt, for about 10 years, is in this unique position of leading one minority group, chasing other minority groups. And I believe that, you know, influences a lot of his take on the situation. this idea for the school is created, the United States government is really focusing on the Dakota Territory. That is where he is sent uh, to bring these children from the Dakotas. They were used as leverage, hostages even, and you bring these children almost all the way across the country to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and you can basically say, you know, hey, if you don't do what we tell you to do on the reservation, well, you're never gonna see your kids again. The first group of students to arrive at Carlisle were 87 children brought from the Rosebud and Pine Ridge agencies. They're separated by gender, so you have the male students and the female students. Within them, you also have the interpreter. This is before they've had their hair cut, been stripped of their regalia, before the, any major change has happened. So very much, you know, as they stepped off the train. Pratt? kind of understood uh, that he needed to make an impact and people needed to be aware of what he was doing. And the best way of doing that at the time was photography. There wasn't moving pictures yet. Well, so photography in the newspapers, how do you get the word out about what you're doing and how great in his mind, you know, what he was doing was and how do you garner additional support? How do you get more students to agree to come? And that is by proving, you know, that what he was doing was good. So if you see a before and after photo of a student, that's impactful to the greater Euro-American population. Out of the almost 8,000 students, there are almost 1,000 student deaths uh, in the 40 years that the school was operating. Most of the students that died while they were students, uh, they were sent home. 
there are some that are here. It does demonstrate a very controlling idea of the government over Native Americans, where in some communities they don't even practice burial. That's not the way they do it. So even in death, you know, they are still being uh, controlled by the United States government. The general population, I don't think, realizes that the United States government had a, a policy of cultural genocide. I think it's important to use the, that term um, and not shy away from what happened here. And you have to be honest if you want to move forward. And if we're not going to be honest about what happened, you know, you can't, you can't move forward. You can't even start healing. in South Dakota ordering an emergency lockdown to curb the coronavirus. But what about rural America, where it is easily a half hour or two hour drive to the nearest hospital? The reservation put in measures even before the virus arrived. Lockdowns, checkpoints, mandatory masks. We were trying to protect everybody on the reservation as much as possible um, and implementing things a little more strict than, than the areas around us. But we felt it was something that was needed to be done and it was, it was quite hard not having the support of, of surrounding governing bodies. South Dakota had one of the highest death rates from the coronavirus per capita in the country. The state of health of people within the reservation, we are uh, high risk for immunocompromising diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure. So, I mean, it was scary that a new disease could come in and worsen what people are already having to deal with. We are, you know, dealing with losing people within our communities. I've lost my mother to COVID um, back in November and it's, it's been a trying time. I just feel bad for anybody that has to endure a loved one being in the hospital with COVID. Um, you're not able to be in with your loved ones. And I think that was one of the hardest things for us is her being in the hospital and us not being able to be there at bedside with her and only being able to communicate um, through FaceTime or the computer. Thousands died. Native Americans died more frequently than any other ethnic group in the U.S., okay. dying at almost twice the rate of white Americans. People have been very reluctant to get the vaccine, mainly because of how fast it was produced, basically, or what people are telling us. Um, it was too quick, too quick. Even with education, um, we, we are getting people to come around to getting the vaccines, but there's still that reluctancy to, to get it. And I think that's why people are scared. If the people wouldn't come to the vaccines, they would take the vaccines out to the people. It's easier to go to the homes than to get them to come to the hospital to do treatment. Uh, there's roughly three million acres and there are roughly about, between nurses, doctors, ward clerks, about 20 of us. The Cheyenne River Reservation was created in 1899 land made up on the Great Plains. It's a deeply spiritual place for the tribes that have lived here for centuries before the Spanish ever arrived to the New World. It's miles upon miles to get anywhere from here. I mean, you're basically in the middle of nowhere. You come from home, which is 30 to 50 miles away, get to work, gather up your stuff, and then turn around and drive another 50 to 80 miles to wherever you're going, just to make sure people can get the medication and the vaccines that they need. There has been a shameful history of medical testing on minorities. There are records of one attempt in the 19th century to give blankets infected with smallpox to Native Americans with the hope that the disease would spread in the communities. Despite the efforts, demand for vaccines has slowed. Old worries that the vaccine might be dangerous or a plot against Native Americans. Our people are, have been experimented on before, so they're a little hesitant when it comes to new things. I think a lot of people think it's something that they're trying to throw at our people to get rid of us. 
The rates of COVID amongst Native communities really peaked at one point and were higher than other parts of the United States and non-Native populations. At the same time that we saw really horrific rates of COVID devastate Native communities, we also saw tribal governments really exhibit extreme leadership in their ability to coordinate vaccination efforts. And there was a very quick swing where tribes um, you know, had some of the highest rates of COVID and then quickly became um, you know, the most vaccinated population, even um, vaccinating non-Native community members in the local area. Some of our workers down here are survivors. And it doesn't necessarily have to be survivor of suicide. No, just life. We're all survivors of something. But look at them, the positive part is they're working. You hear them laughing. You know, you hear them having a job. They're looking forward to a small paycheck. Tiny D is helping prevent suicide by teaching the youth the old ways the traditions and customs. I also train in signs of suicide and sources of strength and go into community to teach them about the signs of suicide because we have a pretty good um, turnout for suicide. You know, the, the rate is like five, six times higher than the other um, nationalities. Tiny D brings the youth out to the countryside, where she hopes to help them connect to the old traditions and customs of the Lakota indigenous. Well, Native Americans are connected to Grandmother Earth, connected to the four-legged, the winged, and there's a ceremony just about for every, everything. There are a lot of spirits in the forest, a lot. And right now, because it's getting closer to evening, they're gonna show themselves. They're gonna say, hey, we're here. Do you got anything for us? And so sometimes people will throw food out or they will hurry up and get things done and go. Because sometimes if a spirit attaches to you, it'll make you sick. Uh, you'll get the cold chills. It's called um, the ghost sickness. Okay, she has her tobacco. She's gifting tobacco to the trees. The forest provides for us, provides firewood, that's the trees, provides the herbs, for medicines, for traditional medicines. Before we cut the tree down, we will make an offering of tobacco. And we asked the forgiveness of every tree, and we prayed. The most troubled youth are those that have lost contact with their indigenous roots. The lost birds, she calls them. They're the lost bird because they leave and they lose their cultural identity. They lose their language. They lose connections to the lineage, to their family and to that tribe. They do not know the language. They do not know the ceremonial ways or the traditions that, that we do all the time, you know, our, our prayers. Land is an absolutely essential issue to everything dealing with indigenous populations, but it also impacts things like criminal jurisdiction, right? And what happens in the event that a crime occurs or um, much of my work focuses, for example, on gender violence, right? Violence against native women. Um, land becomes an essential issue there as well in determining if tribal courts are able to prosecute um, the perpetrator of that crime. Uh, so uh, again, land, is just absolutely essential to you know all aspects of tribal governance but also really just who we are as indigenous people um, having a land-based connection is something that i think is shared across all indigenous communities the elderly members of the community here are special to the tribe this one is a shunkula it's not a shukawaka, the big one. Shunkula is um, it's a small horse. 
טיפי או בלו טחו, זה קורה האף. וסקאי מחביא את טחו, זה בלו סקאי וסטון. My English name is Manny Arnhock, and my Lakota name is Hogak Aksha. I'm also a teacher of uh, Lakota language, and uh, I didn't know an uh, English word until I went to school. The pandemic has been catastrophic for the Native American culture, attacking the elderly who are some of the last speakers of the old languages like Lakota. once the only language spoken and heard across these great plains. The language uh, ties to our, our history, our ceremonies, our uh, sacred sites, defines uh, who you are. Racism and education have at times tried to eradicate the Native American languages. They just uh, didn't have opportunity. They come from boarding schools too. And most of the time, their language is like whipped or being beaten out of them. Because of this traumatic experience, uh, they didn't want their kids to know Lakota. It's changing now. Uh, we have a lot of second language speakers, but there's still a lot of more work to be done. Manny teaches his wife Lakota, who was raised not speaking the indigenous language. Only English. Lakota ya charge tokahe hi huniwi. My Lakota name is Arrives First Woman. I greet you with a, you know, the good heart and handshake. And my English name is Renee I am Fast Horse Ironhawk. When I speak Lakota, I feel like I'm being my actual self that I'm supposed to be. because when I speak English, it's like a foreign language to me, but it's all I've ever known. But when I speak Lakota, I feel like it's coming from my heart. It feels like that's who I am. Back in the late 1800s, I think it was Richard Pratt that said he wanted to save the man and kill the Indian. And as a part of that approach, All Native children that attended these boarding schools, they punished them for speaking their own language and they practically forced them to speak English. Some still would go home and speak Lakota with their parents, so they were able to save their language. Tribal communities are in a really difficult place right now with respect to tribal language because we're not that far removed from the federal boarding school system that institutionalized um, English language only learning systems and literally responded to native children and youth who spoke their tribal language with violence. We have all sorts of stories and anecdotes of people who suffered horrific physical and psychological abuse for speaking their first language, their tribal language. And so we're not that far removed from that generation today. Um, really only one, or in some cases, two generations removed. And because of that, we haven't had huge intergenerational transmission of native languages. fight to save tribal elders and native language speakers who've been devastated by the virus. The danger of the virus to the elderly has put more pressure to teach and share the Lakota language. You have to teach them to be proud of who they are. That way, you know, they'll want to learn the language and they're proud to be Lakota. My name is Iris Eagle Chasing. I've been teaching here at Takini School for 14 years. When I was growing up, everybody spoke Lakota in our community. But today, the language is dying off because we're losing a lot of our Lakota elders, from, especially from this virus. My mom, she was in the boarding school, and they were beaten for speaking their language, or, you know, they got in trouble when they spoke the language. Yahicha Pilamaya. Thank you for coming. A variant for two. Num Gahba, two strike. The Sicharu chief to Wayushbi to pick things, the berries. Nuni is to lose one's way or stray or get lost or be lost. Tehi 
Fika means to to be hard in each case, hard to endure, difficult, terrible, dreadful, sorrowful. In my family, I just have a couple aunts and an uncle that hold on to our culture, our language. Everything that we want to know, we can go to them and they, they have, you know, it's just like a dictionary right there. It's kind of scary that we're the ones holding on to that knowledge now, and we have to you know, be, be careful about it, try to preserve it the best we can so that we can pass it on to our children. And I tell my students, you know, even if you speak one or two words a day, you're thanking our people because we're not gone, we're still here. For thousands of years, men and women have passed down the language and customs through the oral tradition. This has made it vulnerable in a world where so many of the elders are dying. Well, due to the pandemic, we lost a lot of uh, fluent speakers. We lost my uncle. He was a uh, fluent speaker, teacher, and um, some other friends. It's just the whole thing that, that, that they take. Not only language, but history, ceremonies, words. We have a few dictionaries, you know, but... Uh, we still needed our uh, elders to, to speak and uh, to uh, meet. But my uncle over there, he, uh, he caught COVID and uh, he didn't survive. He was mentoring other uh, language speakers that were uh, interested in learning. We're gonna miss him in a big way. They take all their knowledge and understanding with them. That's why it's so important to share share what they have. And yeah, we just need to share. Unfortunately, <clears throat> if we don't act, there's a good chance we might lose our language. And I don't want to see that. There might be as few as 1,000 fluent speakers of Lakota left in the world. Language revitalization is one area where so many tribes are enacting and responding to the need. Um, and this takes shape in many ways. So for example, immersion schools for primary school children, resources, textbooks, Rosetta Stone programs that are available to people who live in the area or even tribal citizens who live outside of their tribal communities' lands. So tribes really are cognizant of the fact that language is a pressing issue and it's a pressing issue not only because of the ability to speak a language, but because of what the language tells us about ourselves and about um, our ancestors, about our culture. There are words, right, that express ideas and concepts that don't necessarily translate to the English language. And so when there's a loss of language, we lose not only the words, right, but that significance as well. Back at the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, okay. Nurse Longbreak is still doing her vaccination rounds. Have you ever been diagnosed with COVID-19 or had a COVID-19 test done that was positive? No. Uh, my brother Roger, he's scared to get it. My son Andrew, he lives up in Bismarck, and he, he said he don't want to get it. They're scared. They're scared they're going to die. Small book, one, two, three. Yes, uh, How long were you sick before you got tested? About a week. About a week? Yeah. Okay. Did you? I, I just thought it was the flu. Ready, dear? Yeah. One, two, three. Didn't even have to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. A lot of the people in the communities do not have transportation. And yes, the tribe does have the transit system, but a lot of them still don't have the dollars to pay for that ride. So this is a big, big help to each and every community within the reservation. Our reservation is, consists of two counties, Zeebok County and Dewey County. And last census, Zeebok County was the poorest county in the United States, and that means half of our reservation. Poverty, uh, overcrowded houses has always been an issue. And that's one of the reasons why we really took and did the uh, things that we've done is because of the 
uh, we felt that uh, we know how our people live in some homes. There could be up to five to six families living in one house, and we knew that it'd be tough for them to quarantine, etc. So we just thought, well, we got to do what we got to do to try to keep everybody safe. We learned that Indigenous Americans were a part of our history, but we don't learn as Americans that they're a part of our present. And we have to understand that in order to make progress, right? That these are vibrant communities all over the country that are still living with the effects of what you know, America did to their ancestors. Um, that's a history worth reckoning with. It's part of who we are. It's not a part of our past that's gone. It's part of our collective present. And we are very far from understanding that. So I don't know what the answer is, but it is really important that we grapple with that question. We have a very strong respect for the horse. They're strong, we use them for a lot of things. And through this time, I always say it delivers hope because those that are struggling, they go on, we get them to go on a ride. We talk to them and say, we got some kids that come in, but they have nothing. So we work together to, to get them ready. And through those four days, they connect to the horse that they're riding. They may not own the horse, but when the horse is provided, they connect to them and they teach them how to work with the horse. Are you ready, crazy horse rider? Let me hear you. You guys are the descendants of Kashla Tashikuiko. So we're very proud of you. And we know he would be proud of you also. The Crazy Horse Ride is a way to pass on the Lakota skill with the horses, to teach the young to ride and honor the Native American veterans. It's a pretty much a four-day event. There's three rides in it. There's a 40-miler, a 20-miler, and another 20-miler. It's a really a tough ride, so it's a good confidence builder for life skills, helps our kids to endure the hardships of life and it's a heck of an accomplishment for a kid and we're proud of them when they get done and we honor them and it's a good thing to see our kids here you know it gives them a piece of what our ancestors had crazy horse is the most famous lakota war leader a lot of how we live our life are modeled how he lived his life. You know, being a warrior, it really ties into our roots and who we are as a people and keeping those traditions alive is an integral part of who we are embedded in our DNA and our ancestral lineage and stuff like that. It's a huge piece to our puzzle as who we are as Lakota people. There's a huge identity crisis when it comes to Native American teenagers. Over the years, you know, a lot of us, including myself, have lost our identity and it's hard to kind of come back home, especially after the military and trying to figure out who we are as a, as a people, who you are as a person. And so actually practicing those types of traditions and stuff like that wasn't um, a big part of my life. Uh, my family practiced. I just never really took interest until after I became an adult, unfortunately, and I really wish that I you know, participated when I was younger because my grandparents are no longer alive. After a four-day journey, the riders arrive to Pine Ridge, their remembrance of Crazy Horse now done for another year. Why are we praying on this ride? You rode for four days, and each day they gave you a different topic. So they're praying for our young people that are struggling. They're praying for those that are contemplating suicide. They're praying for all the alcohol and drug addictions. They're praying for the elders, our wisdom keepers, because the elders take care of the history and they hand down that to the children. And I, I was so proud and I told them, you know, people talk about hope, but you're the hope. And I'm not putting pressure on you, but you finished the ride and you're the hope, you're my hope for a better tomorrow. 
we can always do with a, a better tomorrow. And I told them, you know, you could do bad all by yourself, but you could do good all by yourself. <laughs>